Good morning and happy Mother's Day. You know, I want to celebrate not only the moms today, but I think we should remember and celebrate and honor all of the ladies who have poured into our lives. Because it's not just moms. All of us have been impacted by a teacher, a mentor, a coach, a church leader, a troop leader. How many Girl Scouts? Oh, yes, a a troop leader. There have been so many women who have poured into our lives. So I want to honor and celebrate all of the ladies who love their people. Let's put our hands together for them. Yes. We also recognize that while we celebrate and around Lake Hills Church, we love to celebrate, um, we look for any occasion on which to celebrate, that not everyone enjoys Mother's Day, that this day can actually be a struggle for some. And so if that's you today, for whatever reason, if you're not feeling like celebrating, that's okay. And we're glad you're here. We believe that God has a message for you. Actually, I believe that God has a message for everyone today. So let's bow our heads and say a prayer so we can get started. God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the gift of church, for the gift of your word, for the gift of family and church family. I ask right now, God, that you settle our hearts and minds and open our eyes and ears so that we can see and hear what you want us to learn today. God, do something that only you can do. Take these words I've prepared and touch every heart with your truth and your love. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Guys, I'm going to need a little more participation than that. Um, You know, I've been over in K-1-2 over there for the last like nine months or so, maybe. Uh, They're amazing. And they think I sound like Whitney Houston when I sing. And so they give me a lot of response all the time. So I've kind of gotten used to it over there, okay? So I may need a little more from you. Um, As Max said, I am his wife, and I realize that I have not taught in here in over a year. It has been so long that I have been in here. I mentioned that I've been over in K-1-2, my very favorite room on this campus. Um, And also, we paused our Fearless Mom ministry for a year because um, we had two weddings in our house in the last six months. And so it's been so exciting and so fun. And I wanted to be fully present for that. And I've had such a blast getting to be a mom and getting to be over in K-1-2. But I realized that some of you, I may never have met you. And so I'm so glad that um, you're here. And I wanted to take a minute and introduce or reintroduce myself to you. Um, Mac and I have been married for almost 33 years. Clearly, we were 12 when we married. Um, And so we uh, love doing life and ministry together. And we have two kids that grew up in our home, Emily and Joseph. Did y'all see that picture of us on horseback? Did we look so natural or what? I love, I have shown that picture and I will continue to show that picture. Okay, sorry, I distracted myself already. What am I, two minutes in? Um, And we have two kids that grew up in our house, Emily and Joe. And then we also have um, two kids that grafted into our family um, in their later years, Allison and Sylvie. So we have four. We love being a family of four, but guess what? God had big plans. And so let's see, about almost three years ago, Allison married Will. And then in November, Emily married Jordan. And then two weeks ago, Joe married Abby. And so we now have seven children. Oh, my word. Yes, for those of you scoring at home, Christmas, so much fun with seven kids. It's amazing. Uh, But at 55, I was kind of missing the baby stage. And so we got a new baby in our home. And, you know, what I realized at 55 is that time just goes by so quickly. And so we handled this baby a little different. Um, I have a picture of her for, yes. This is Hattie Louise. And Matt calls her Hattie Lou and he sings Hattie Lou, Hattie Lou, Hattie Lou, Hattie Lou, yeah. That's right. That's how we feel about Hattie Lou. She is a hallelujah for us. Now, um, 
What's so funny is uh, I had to text my children and ask them for wedding pictures, but I opened my phone and was able to find a couple of other pictures of Hattie Lou for you. So I've got a couple of more. <laughs> and just for the record, I had to delete several because there were too many. We love Hattie Lou. And here's the thing about Hattie. Um, she has behaviors that some in our family call misbehaviors. And we think they're adorable, Mac and I do. Her favorite thing, she gets the toilet paper roll. She's so clever. And she pulls it all through the house and pulls it out and around the coffee table. Guys, my reflex is, somebody get the camera. It's adorable. Her very favorite toy is our carpet in our bedroom. Um, and it's convenient because it's always there. And so the threshold between our bedroom and our bathroom, she has completely shredded. And so, y'all, she will look up and have carpet. They're all hanging down. What is my reflex? Mac, grab your phone. She is adorable. I know. We're pitiful. And so, yeah, I told y'all that we have a ministry called Fearless Mom. I'm doing the opposite of Fearless Mom with Hattie. So, let's see, it was a Kentucky Derby. The kids came over to watch the Derby with us. And um, so, we're watching and watching all the pregame stuff and everything. And I hear multiple times, no, ma'am, Hattie, no, ma'am, no, no. Emily and Sylvie, in a very harsh tone. And so I look over, and Hattie Louise has a shoe every time they do it. And so I had to kindly inform them with a much kinder tone than they use with Hattie. I said, guys, she loves shoes. And she really loves shoestrings. And so we let her do that because she loves it. And they <laughs> looked at me like, you have to train her not to eat shoes. I said, no, I don't. Um, you're the human. And actually, you're a guest in our house right now. And so you put your shoe up on the table if you don't want her to have it. She is just a puppy. And so I heard him again. I heard him again. They said, Mom, you have to discipline her. This is terrible. And I said, but I don't. I don't have to discipline her. Because unlike you guys, Hattie never has to get a job. Hattie doesn't have to be an adult. She's not going to college. She's not taking any tests. She doesn't have to pack her backpack ever. Guys, she doesn't even have to walk around. Do you know I have a stroller for her? <laughs> and it converts to a car seat. It is amazing. And I'll be strolling and people will say, I thought that was a baby. And I'll say, it is. <laughs> it is a baby. And she is the cutest baby. She is precious. And I said, here's the thing about Hattie, guys. Hattie, I don't have to parent her. Because we know in Fearless Mom, what do we always say? We say our responsibility, our job as parents is to raise up resilient, competent, independent adult children. That's our job. That's our responsibility. We are called. We are commanded to equip them with life skills, to arm them with God's word, and to set them up for their best lives. Our job, it's very clear in scripture, our job is to do our best to set them up for their best. And in Fearless Mom, we say it all the time that yes, scripture commands it. Throughout scripture, we see God's command to parents and his charge on parents. And then we know that all of those biblical truths are backed by and reinforced and echoed by sociological, educational, um, scientific, medical research. And so we know that's our calling as parents. And we say all the time that when you consider what a parent is supposed to do, when you really think about the responsibility of being a parent, the appropriate response is to throw up in your mouth a little bit. <laughs> And so we say in Fearless Mom, you got a choice. You spit it out or swallow it and you keep going. That's the job. That's the calling. It is what is required of us as parents. It is overwhelming. It is never ending, as my parents will attest to. And you know what? It's exhausting. But it's the job. It's what we're called to do. And as Winston Churchill said, Honey, this is just for you, a Winston Churchill quote. As Winston Churchill said, he said, sometimes it is not enough to do our best. 
we must do what is required. Sometimes it's not enough just to do your best. We must do what is required. And sometimes, actually oftentimes, what is required of us is beyond our resources, beyond our capacity, beyond our abilities. And that is certainly true about parenting, but it's not limited to parenting. We've all been in a situation relationally that is beyond our capacity. We've been in a situation professionally, financially, emotionally. We've all been in situations and we will continue to be in situations that are beyond our abilities, beyond our capacity. But this is where God shows up. And it is in those times, in those circumstances where God displays his godness. And that's what we're going to talk about. Again, yes, today we're celebrating motherhood and that's amazing, but it's not limited to parenting. Every area of your life will show places where you need outside help, where what is being asked of you is beyond you. But thank goodness we serve a God and nothing, everybody say nothing. Oh, I'll give that a B plus. Let's try it one more time. Everybody say nothing. Nothing Nothing is beyond our God. He is good and he is great. We are going to look at 1 Kings today as our scripture. And we're going to look and say, okay, God, what, what should we do when life requires more of us than we um, have? And we're going to look at the prophet Elijah. Now, I'm going to read some verses just to give you a little background. And then we're going to show some verses up there. And I'm going to ask you to read the highlighted words with me. Heads up. I was a classroom teacher, and so I will pause, and we will redo it over and over until we have 100% participation. Just wanted to give you a heads up. That is not awkward for me. It's actually just part of the job. (laughs) Now, we know from Scripture that Elijah was in a time of famine and that he was without food. And so in verse 8 of 1 Kings 17... Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. That's important to remember. God had instructed a widow there to feed him. So Elijah went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. Now, verse 12, it's going to be up on the screen. This is where you're going to read with me. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil at the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I will die. This woman had lost all hope. She thought, this is it. We're at the end now. She was at the end of her flower. She was at the end of her oil. She was at the end of herself. She had no hope for a solution to the problem. She had no hope for the end of the struggle. She thought, this is it. Let's keep reading in verse 13. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said. Meaning, go ahead and make the bread for you and your son. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Are you kidding me right now? She must have been like, is this a joke? Did you not just hear what I said? Then... Use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always. One more time. There will. Always. One last time. There will. Always. Be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. You go ahead, Elijah said. Make the bread for you and your son. But before you do that, make mine first. Make mine first. Because the Lord your God says, 
I will provide enough. In my head, this woman, first of all, if it were me, so I don't want to put this stuff on the widow. Maybe she was a lot nicer than I am. And I'm thinking, is, this, is he kidding me right now? I have literally just said I have a handful of flour. And he's like, I'm so hungry. Can you make mine first? It's not the way she responded. She knew. Because remember I read to you, God had told a widow that she would feed his prophet. So see, she knew that this prophet was from God. And so she was going to do what he said. She was going to do it. And so she went in. She gets the handful of flour and the oil. She makes his first. Let's look. I cannot imagine when she realized what was being asked of her. It must have been so confusing. It must have been so frightening. But let's look at her response. Verse 15. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. There was always enough. God provided what she needed at the right time and the right amount. Every day, it says, until it rained again. We don't know how many days, but it says days, so we know it was several. And so we know that she went every day, and there was always enough, always enough. Our God is so good. He knows where you're lacking. He knows your struggle. He knows your difficult situation. And he says, I will always give you enough. You will always have enough if you trust in me. Now, Mac, um, our church has been in a series called Greater Love. And Mac showed us the four types of love that are listed in scripture. Four types of love that are shown in scripture. We're going to show them on this slide up here. And um, I'm going to hit them really quickly. The four types of love. Storge. Parental, protective love, appropriate to talk about on Mother's Day. Phileo, sibling or a close friendship. Eros, the romantic, sensual, passionate love. And finally, agape. Everybody say agape. Agape love. This love is unconditional, sacrificial, healing, and eternal. This love is from God. This love is from God. The first three loves, Storge, Phileo, and Eros, those three are conditional and they're limited because that's human love. That's human love. We will get to the end of ourselves. But that fourth one, agape, agape, unconditional, sacrificial, healing, eternal. This is God's love. The love he shows for us and the love he pours into us and allows us to give to other people. Agape love. Now, has anybody ever taken a sip of a Diet Coke, a Sprite, a Dr. Pepper, a Coke, that has lost its fizz. Have you ever done that? What do we say? We say it's, it's flat. It has no life. It's like wet syrup. I mean, I don't like Dr. Pepper anyway, but a flat Dr. Pepper, come on. It's just wet syrup. It's not the way it was supposed to be. But if you have one that is the way it's supposed to be, when it's infused with the carbonation, not only does it taste different. It looks different. It sounds different. It feels different. When I was listening to Mac's message and I saw all these lists of loves, I, go, I said, Mac, I said, Mac, agape is carbonation. It was so clear to me. Agape is carbonation. And yes, he looked as confused as you do right now. And I said, storge love and eros love and phileo love, that's like the syrup. That's the good stuff. But then when infused with the agape love, they're effervescent. They come to life. When we put God into everything we do, when we filter all of our decisions through his word, when we say, God, I want you to not only be a part of every dime I make, but every dime I spend. I want you to be a part of every relationship. I want you to be part of my, my job at work. I want you to be part of every part of my life. That's putting carbonation into everything we do, every relationship, every choice that we make. It's saying, God, you make life better. 
you add effervescence. When you are involved in my life, it looks different. It tastes different. It, everything is different. It feels different. I believe with all my heart that, yes, we are limited as humans, with limited wisdom, limited peace, limited hope, limited joy when we depend on ourselves, limited discernment. Limited ideas. I get stuck and I can't get out of the struggle or I can't see an end to the problem. But then I say, but God, you are the effervescence. You are the carbonation. I want to live a carbonated life. And that's what I believe God's design and God's desire for us is. Living a carbonated life. You will get to the end of yourself. You will never get to the end of God. We are designed to live a carbonated life. So how do we do that? I actually believe that Elijah um, gives us a great framework for living a carbonated life. So I'm gonna give you three quick points. Living a carbonated life, what do they do? You start with look and listen. Look and listen. Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek him first and live righteously means obey him. And he will give you everything you need. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Look for him. Listen for him. What do I mean by that? Would it be amazing if God spoke in an audible voice? That would be incredible. But odds are, I don't know, maybe he does to you and that's amazing. We should have coffee. But odds are he's going to speak to you through prayer. If you give time, do you, do you have listening time in your prayer or just talking time? He's going to speak to you when you're quiet in your car, when you're alone and saying, God, I'm listening. He's going to speak to you through his word, through Bible study, through church, through worship. But we have to choose to look and listen. Elijah recognized that widow. I'm like, how did he know that was the widow? How did he know that's the one who was going to feed him? I'm like, did she have a W on her? You know, like Laverne's sweater? Like, did she have a W? How did he know? And Mac will tell me when it, he's like, you're getting too into the details here. Just trust that somehow he knew. I'm like, yeah, but I need to know how. And he's like, you don't need to know. I want to know how. But this is what I do know. He looked for God and he listened because God spoke to him. The widow, the Bible says that God said, I told her she was listening. She was looking for him and listening. So number one, look and listen. Whether you hear an audible voice or not, look and listen for God as you make every decision in your life. And number two, trust and obey. Trust and obey. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. It's not highlighted, but everybody say all when I get to it. Seek his will in all. all you do. We tend to have compartments that we save, like that God, okay, God, I know you need to be in my relationships, but my finances, I don't know, boundaries. Now, God doesn't have boundaries. You want a carbonated life, you infuse them into everything that you do. Again, every dime you make, every dime you spend, say, God, this is for you, show me how. Trust in all you do and lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. God told Elijah to go to Zarephath for food. And what did Elijah do? He went and God provided. And then he told the widow, feed the prophet. And again, she knew this prophet was from God. So when the prophet said, feed me first and then your child. What? This goes against everything in her mother's DNA. But she trusted and obeyed, even when it didn't make sense to her. How many times have we looked and listened? And man, I can get here, I can look and listen. I'm praying, God, show me the way. And he shows me a way, but it doesn't make sense to me. So I look and listen some more. And then I'll look and pray some more. And God will say this way. And I'll go, I don't, I'm going to pray some more about it. I'm going to pray some more because that way doesn't really make sense to me. And, or that way doesn't sound fun. So I'm definitely avoiding that way. And so I'll look and listen. You know what? Trust and obey. 
trust and obey. If you're needing supernatural intervention in your life, in a relationship, in your finances, in your profession, in your emotional health, look and listen and then trust and obey. Over and over again, we see God do miraculous things, but almost every time it's preceded by a human's obedience. Because we do the super, we do the natural, and then God comes in and does the supernatural. Peter walked on water, but you know what he had to do? He had to step out of the boat. That's a natural move, and it was followed by the supernatural. Jesus turned the water into wine, but he told them, go fill the jugs. They filled the jugs. They obeyed, and then he did the miracle. He turned it into wine. And the man, he put the, he put the, um, the blind man, put the mud on his eyes. And the man still couldn't see. And then he said, wash it off. And then you will see. And the man obeyed. And then the miracle happened. What is God calling you to do? Where he's saying, just take the next step. Let me worry about solving the problem. But you have to trust and obey. Even when it doesn't make sense. And it's taking the next right step. And you're thinking, but that didn't really fix the problem. He's like, settle down, cowgirl. I mean, I don't know. If I had my own biblical translation, it may have some of that stuff in there. Or Missy, you know, settle down. Take the next right step. Do the next right thing. Okay, so look and listen. Trust and obey. And finally, rinse and repeat. If you are in Fearless Mom, you hear us say this phrase all the time. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. We want immediate change. I obeyed. I need to see the miracle. And he's saying, rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. In my head, I start, I get in my head a lot, confession. Um, I know it's shocking. But when God said, through Elijah, feed him first, and then I will give you everything you need. She goes in, and I'm wondering, when he said, I will provide until it rains again and the crops grow? Did she go in and lift the lid and it's like, it's full of flour. Bring on the famine. I, I don't know. Or did she go in and there was just enough every day? Because it said for days, days, multiple times. I tend to believe that it was just enough every day. And that every day, she made Elijah's food, she made her child's food, she made her food. She trusted and obeyed every day. And then the next day, she went in. There's enough, and she did it again. And then the next day, there's enough. I so often go to God, like I'm gonna take off the lid for this thing I've prayed for, and I want it to be overflowing. I want plenty. And God is saying, I will give you enough. For those of you who know me, you know, if you've been a fearless mom, you know I have a huge fear of public speaking. Um, It's not a joke. Like, I want to vomit every single time. And when Max said, uh, you know, I walked out and I said, I'm not doing it. I'm in it. And he was so mean, it made me do it. And so I, I have prayed God, please remove this fear from me. I know that you're calling me to do this and I love Fearless Mom and I love teaching and I've been so fortunate to get through conferences across the country and it's amazing. And I want to throw up every time, every time. And so I'm like, what is happening? And I am out. And then I go, okay, God, so I'm down here legit. Singing this song, I speak Jesus over fear and anxiety. I'm like, please, God, please, God, remove it. And you know how much he gives me? Enough. I want it to be all gone. I want my circumstance to change. I want my problem to be gone. I want to see a clear path to the solution. And he says, I'll give you enough. And every single time, it's hard. I don't like hard. I don't want it to be hard. I don't want it to be uncomfortable. I like fun. And I like easy. And he's saying, look and listen, trust and obey, rinse and repeat. I will give you plenty. I will give you, what is it? Enough. I will give you enough. That's what he promises. And 
I don't know your struggle. I don't know your circumstance or your situation. But if you're thinking like, I've been looking and listening. I've been trusting and obeying. I am rinsing and repeating all the time. I will tell you this. Your struggle, your difficult circumstance, it may not change. It may not go away. But how you handle it may change. How you view it, your posture. Your circumstance may not change, but a carbonated life changes how you look at it. Remember carbonation changes how, how it looks, how it feels, how it tastes, how it sounds. So maybe your language about whatever your situation changes. Maybe how you look at it changes. Maybe how you feel about it changes. But I know this. I know that whatever that situation, that struggle, whatever it is that you're thinking, what is being required of me is beyond my resources. God is saying, it's not beyond mine. It's not beyond mine. And I promise, God promises, he will use everything for his glory and our good. Romans 8, 28, nothing is wasted in God's economy. You think, well, this makes no sense. Well, when has God ever made sense? He is beyond our reasoning. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are beyond our ways. But he says, trust and obey, rinse and repeat, and you will have enough until the rain falls and the crops grow. You will have enough. What an incredible promise. You know, John 10, 10 is probably my favorite verse in scripture. My favorite verse, and I, I quote it all the time. John 10, 10 is Jesus himself speaking. And he says, the enemy, the enemy comes to steal, to kill and destroy, to steal your joy, to kill your peace, to rob you of your hope. But Jesus says, but I have come. I have come, Jesus says, that you may have life and have it to the full, an abundant life, an overflowing life. Some may say a carbonated life. That's why Jesus comes and have it to the full. And so if you're in an area, if you can look in an area of your life that's flat, it's not God's design and desire. Don't settle for flat. He is the effervescence. He is the carbonation, and he wants that for you. We should never be okay with flat because we're called to more. We're created for more. This agape love that God says, God talks about, it's for everyone. We just have to step into relationship with him to receive that love, and then it flows through us into everything we do. And if you've never stepped into that relationship, if you've never received that agape love from God, then we want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. God loves you. He is with you. He is for you. But because of our limited resources and our humanness, we are separated from him. But Jesus solved the separation and he died on the cross and he rose again with the promise of new life for anyone who believes in him and trusts him and says, I want you to be Lord of my life because I know that your way is the best way. And if you've never stepped into that relationship, we'd love to give you an opportunity right now, right now to begin that process of living a carbonated life. Let's bow our heads together. God, we thank you for the promise of new life, for the promise of abundant life, the promise of carbonated life. We wanna see you. We wanna hear you. Help us to remember to look and listen. And God, give us the courage and the strength to trust and obey and the persistence and the patience to rinse and repeat. And if you're out there and you've never stepped into the relationship with God through Jesus, all you have to do is say this to yourself, God, I know you love me. I want to be in relationship with you, but my sin separates us. I know that. I receive Jesus' forgiveness. And I 
want to respond to the promise of new life by asking you, Jesus, to be Lord of my life. I submit all that I am to you.